Well, good to see you again today. We were still here when it became today. And uh, had a great watch night service. If you were able to be with us, we enjoyed it always. The weather might have cut our crowd a little bit. Some of us, if we'd have brought a pillar, we'd have stayed the rest of the night. When we went outside and saw how foggy it was and how hard it was going to be to get home, uh, I was telling somebody about it this morning. They said, you know it was foggy. Preacher said he drove slow getting home. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> it was the only way to get there. But it was a mess last night. And then I think all the firecrackers they were shooting off, guns, whatever they were shooting off, might have added to the smoke, added to the thing. Some of us around here are old enough to remember some winters in Florida when, when uh, the fog and the smoke was mixed and it cost a lot of lives. Some idiot would always set the woods on fire at the wrong time of year. And uh, there's plenty of them around, some of them on the government payroll, that uh, did it officially. And that was how I often said that's the dumbest thing in the world to set the woods on fire when the, in the foggy season. And it has cost some lives. I, I graduated with a boy that lived down Johnson Avenue. And the first winter after we graduated, we were both going to work. He going one way and me another about daylight, and he in a truck. Uh, collided and his car caught a fire and he burned alive in that car. It was a terrible thing. And uh, all because of stupidity of uh, mixing the smoke uh, with the fog. And uh, thankfully, uh, things have cleared up. I don't know if we can credit global warming or not. <laughs> Buffalo, New York might argue with us about global warming this year, if you've seen any of that on TV. They're actually talking about snow bombs. Did you see any of that? It said a snow bomb fell on the interstate and it actually covered up some semis and, and trucks, big trucks, and stopped them. Anyway, we had a great night last night. We're going to try to get everything back on routine now. Uh, you know, the routine is the important thing. That's why it is a routine, like three meals a day. That's a routine, but it's important, right? <laughs> right? And a lot of other things that uh, say, well, I'm used to that. You're used to it because it's important. We have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But when I got married, I found out my wife did not like shortcuts, like hanging my clothes on the bedstead instead of putting them in the closet and leaving my shoes where I pulled them off. And still have a little problem with that sometime, but uh, I've got her trained better now. <laughs> anyway... Uh, the good part of it is to get back to normal here at church is, 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 is a good thing because normal around here is a good thing. I was impressed last night and praise God for it as I heard Brother Parsons uh, give the year reports and uh, how God has not only kept the ministry going, he's basically enlarged it. It's increased in the period of time, these two years that I've uh, retired. Uh, I will say this, when I retired, the staff around here probably got tired because Brother Parsons come in with a little more energy and said, let's get busy. <laughs> and uh, that's what's happened, and that's a good thing. And we praise the Lord for it. I don't know where he gets his energy from. I do, too. It's the Lord. But uh, uh, he's, he went and preached this morning, which he does pretty much every Sunday morning, at one of the, uh, I'll call them trailer parks, that's probably an insulting word, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, they have uh, social centers and so forth in them, so uh, he, he does that at nine o'clock, then he comes back and teaches his Sunday school class at 10. Before that, he makes sure his bus route is off and running, <laughs> and just no grass growing under his feet, I'll tell you that. He's really getting, getting around, and uh, Seeing the results of it, too. God's blessing it, and we praise the Lord for that. I was impressed again last night about the ministry as a whole. I heard the reports, Brother Donahue, on the children's homes and the orphans' homes and things that's going on and the souls that's being saved. So Landmark's ministry now is around the world in so many different ways, the mission field so many different ways. And... Uh, 
While we might not always be conscious of that sitting here in the auditorium and maybe just what we see when we come, but it's a lot bigger than that. And what we're doing is important when it comes to that mission gauge. And last night we got a good report on, on that again. And all that we're doing, uh, praying, giving, all that helps that worldwide ministry and numbers of souls to keep being, uh, being reached. All right, I said I'll get back to normal. We're going to go back to 1 John. Last week I, I taught some on, uh, on more relevant to the Christmas season. I'm going to go back to 1 John in the last chapters, chapter 5. Now, we've said this over and over to you. John is a, a letter, a book uh, of great assurance to the family of God, to believers, to those. It's an inside book, those that have been born again and the family of God. We have uh, great assurance. We have knowledge, things we can be certain of. And John uh, repeats and repeats. He talks about a lot about uh, God's love. Uh, he talks about us being able to know things. And here as we get a little deeper into chapter 5, we'll also uh, reach into some uh, doctrine a little bit. But uh, it's a book written to believers. And it is by the same John that wrote what we sometimes refer to as the Gospel of John, even though it's the Gospel of Jesus Christ recorded by John. And because uh, you'll run across similar words, words like no, but words like begotten. And uh, we, of course, think of John 3.16 and recognize the same writing and the same style. I've said this over and over. The Bible is, God is the author. It is his inspired word. And God uses different men as he used uh, in mean, different ways. He used John one way and Paul another. No contradiction, but just uh, adding to the truth. And uh, you think uh, about that. Somebody said, well, I, I read that book and that's why I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. I, I think I see his style. Well, it's God's style and that is a little bit of a debate about who wrote it. I kind of think Paul did too. But uh, you might pick up a, a ballpoint pen, a fountain pen, and you might pick up one that writes with dark ink, or one that writes with blue ink, or one with red ink, or some other color, but you can write all the same words with every one of them. And uh, God did that. He used Apostle Paul as, with, as he picked up a pen and wrote himself. He did the same thing with John. So we might recognize the style of each writer, but it's God's style. God used them, knowing what he was doing with that all the way through. So John is unique in that to respect. Now we're going to start uh, uh, here uh, in chapter 5, kind of building, of course, on what he's already said. He's talked about if we love God, we ought to love our brother, as he ends up in uh, chapter 4. And then in verse 5, he says, whosoever, now whosoever is one of uh, uh, John's words. Uh, we think about John 3.16, whosoever believeth. And uh, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So you got reference here to God the Father and God the Son. God the Father doing the begatting, the Lord Jesus here, the one that was begotten, the only begotten Son of God. These references here, uh, again, identify John with us uh, so, so very, uh, very well. Now, as a thing in politics today and has been, I guess, for many, many years, where they like to mention God, but not Jesus. They like to mention the Father, but not the Son. And this verse uh, points out that error and that hypocrisy. Uh, it is amazing. Jesus was crucified under the charge by the Sanhedrin, by the hierarchy of Judaism and the high priest of, of being, making himself God, claiming to be God. That same issue is what we see in politics today. <clears throat> yes, we'll honor God, but not Jesus. Yeah. I appreciated Ronald Reagan and a few other presidents that we've had at times 
that uh, use the name of Jesus like they should have. <clears throat> but so many of them are, are hypocritical in it because all they want is to deceive the public in the voting form is about what it amounts to in many, many cases. <clears throat> and uh, if you want to test a guy's uh, faith, you want to test to see if he's really saved, you bring up the name of Jesus. <laughs> What he thinks about Jesus will tell you real quick where his relationship with the Father is. You can't have one. John writes in another place that you can't honor uh, the Father without honoring the Son. And so we have that in this very, uh, very first uh, verse here. And it says in verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now here's a little test. Uh, love <coughs> is mentioned much in, with John, and it is a test. When a man gets saved, his love life changes <laughs> in a real way. <clears throat> he falls out of love with the world, and he falls in love with God, and the two are different. <clears throat> and uh, the biggest thing the devil keeps a man from being saved over is he's gonna have to give up the world. When I say the world, I'm talking about the things of the world. I'm talking about the things of the lust of the flesh are involved in. <clears throat> and that's not always a sexual thing. Oftentimes, and most of the times, even, even in the sexual reign, uh, as other places, it is, uh, it is nothing more than covetousness. The last of the big ten commandments, thou shalt not covet. The flesh covets. It argues for what it wants. <clears throat> it deceives us. It starts, the uh, Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it starts in our thinking, in our little computer up here. And you think on something and dwell on it long enough that you won't, you'll pretty soon find your hand reach it out to get it. Yeah. That's the control up there. That's the control center. <clears throat> and yes, the Bible tells us, let, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now, when I think on the things he wants, uh, I'm really thinking on the things that are best for me. But the flesh says, no, I want something else. And that's the conflict. We all have those two natures. Yes, even after you're saved, you still have an old nature. <laughs> that's where the warfare develops. That's where the struggle and the fight comes from, is those two, two natures. One wanting to do one thing, one another. I never did, I don't remember much about it, but there was, uh, Sometime you can reference, people will recognize, say, Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. Remember anything about that? Yep. Well, that depicts pretty good the Christian because we, both, we have both natures. I don't know if you ever read deep things like Dagwood in the funnies. <laughs> I still read Dagwood if I could find him somewhere. Uh, I remember Dagwood as far back as when Cookie was born. That's further back than most of y'all. Let me just, let me get a hand showing on this. How many remember the comic strip when Cookie was born and they put out in the comic strip, uh, help us name the baby. And so people wrote in naming the baby. Uh, I, all right, Brother Parsons said something about it. Uh, Last night or Sunday night, he said the preacher thinks he remembers way back, <clears throat> but he just, somebody told him and he thinks it's true. Now, he didn't say it directly to me, but he attributed that to me. <laughs> well, I do remember. <laughs> and I remember mother talking to my brother and I about picking a name for Dagwood's baby, Dagwood and Blondie's baby. And we shot some names at her. I don't think Cookie was one of them, but I do remember that going on in the comic strip. Now, I brought up Dagwood to say I was talking about two natures, <clears throat> in the, even in the believer. And sometimes, have you noticed uh, early, early writings now, I, I guess it's been redone some since, but in some of the early writings of Dagwood, you'd see the conflict <clears throat> between him doing right and doing wrong. And the, the, I forget the guy that drew this strip, but he would depict the expression of Dagwood's face. And Dagwood would get that kind of conning, evil look on his face. I'm going to get this guy. 
And it would show sometimes a little demon on one shoulder, a little devil on one shoulder of Dagwood or a little angel on the other shoulder. That's a Bible truth whether you know it or not. It's a little bit, a little bit the story of the old Indian that had two dogs and, and they were fighting all the time. And uh, somebody asked the old Indian, said, which dog wins? He said, the one I feed the most. And that's exactly the way it is with us. You feed the wrong side, it'll win. You starve it, and let the good side win. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. And uh, the difference is this, and the good difference is that if you say born again, you have a Holy Spirit on your side to help you. He not only helps you in giving you power to say no to what you should say no to, but the Holy Spirit also reveals to you what is right and what is wrong. Oh, uh, you know, old, uh, what's his name? I forget it. The comedian uh, uh, said the devil made me do it. <clears throat> well, the devil makes you do it when you agree with him. <laughs> you still have a choice. <clears throat> you can still say no. And though the flesh covets and wants to do wrong, we still have that choice that we make. And so it's really easy and I've had young people, especially young people, argue with me and I say, all you want to do is give the wrong side the edge. You're feeding the wrong dog. Uh, you're going to lose every time. How do you feed the right one? Well, with the Word of God, <laughs> with prayer, with church, with good friends that know the Lord, the crowd you run with. Somebody has rightly said, you show me the crowd you run with and I'll show you your future. And there's a lot of truth in that. Oh, uh, so many times, young Christians in the Lord think, I'll go back to the same old crowd and win them. You will if you keep an arm distance. Don't get in the hog pen with them. And uh, it's real easy to go back and get in the hog pen. You don't go sit on the bar stool to win that buddy over a drink. That won't work. In fact, He'll condemn you for it, though with his words he may all come on. But in his heart he's saying, don't do it. I need to get out of this mess myself. And uh, that's the struggle that we all have. So John gives us some great assurance here about this. And he says, this we, by this we know. We've got this love in us he's talking about. We are born of God in Jesus Christ. This we know that we love the children of God. Your taste changes. I've said this so many times. You've heard my testimony and so many others. I walked in church as a lost young man, knowing no gospel, only listening to the gossip I had heard that everybody that went to church were fakes and hypocrites. That's what I thought. Uh, so I, I went in with a critical spirit, with a critical attitude. I criticized the preacher, the song leader, the choir, just critical. But when I got saved, I flip-flopped. I fell in love with the people I'd been misjudging, criticizing. It was so noticeable to me. You know, when we see somebody saved in church and the preacher brings them down here and stands up and tells us about it. <clears throat> I remember when the preacher did that with me and uh, People came down and shook my hands. Now, we, we often shortcut this, don't we, especially in the church our size. But uh, I'll tell you what, it's important to the one that just got saved. God can use that. He used it on me. I remember, I still see their faces. I still remember the people uh, that come by and shook my hands and said kind things to me. And I'm smiling back at them. And I am. But in my heart, I'm saying, that's not what I thought about you. <laughs> I remember a lady, she was a great Christian lady. She sang in the choir. She had a powerful voice. She was a good singer. But as a visitor in the church, I spotted her in the choir singing out. And uh, I thought, is she showing off? But when I got saved and she came down, she had a tear in, a tear in her eye. She had wet eyes as she shook my hand and she said this, I didn't know who you were, 
but I was praying for you. See, I remember that after oh, 100 years, long time. You know what I thought in my heart? I thought I sure wasn't praying for you. I was thinking critical of you. I remember a lady <clears throat> in the choir that bounced when she sang. And I thought, that pew's going to break one of these days. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was critical. But when I got saved, she came walking by and, and uh, oh, I'm so thankful you got saved. You know what? I fell in love with the crowd I'd been criticizing. Uh, Brother David Fowler, later my school principal here, amazing how God works things around. But he was a song leader. And he did a good job, but he wasn't a professional. He was just, uh, he was just one of the crowd doing the best he could. And, and uh, I came in and he was waving his arms and doing what song leaders do, Brother Burt. And uh, I thought, hey, look at that guy showing off in front of the women. That guy turned out to be one of my lifelong best friends and even served here on my staff with me years later. That's a change. <laughs> that's one side of the street to the other side. And that's what God does for you <clears throat> when you get saved. <clears throat> you get the edge on the old nature if you want it. <clears throat> you can say no to it. You may not win every time, but the times you lose will bother you till you fix it, till you get it right. <clears throat> that's, that's the evidence of the Holy Spirit within us, of course. So as I look at these verses, <clears throat> John is a big comfort to me as I go through and realize he's reading my mail. He's, he's reading my heart. He, he, the things he's saying, I, I do know to be real because not just by what the Word says, but by my own personal experience uh, also. And so we go down through this. It's a great uh, book to know, and we'll get even deeper here maybe next week in this chapter, greatest chapter, great chapter on assurance. And he says, we know. I like that. The world thinks they know. Only believers do know. Amen. There's a big difference. One thing to think you're right, something else to be right. I think it's Proverbs <clears throat> chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. A fellow following the way of death thinks he's doing right. From the dope shooters to the alcoholics and all those, that, that, those were crutches they grabbed on. They got deceived. They listened to the wrong crowd, done the wrong thing. And of course, behind all that is the devil giggling his head off at the foolishness of man and how easy they are to deceive. But it says here uh, in verse 2, by this we know that we love <clears throat> the children of God. And now notice here's a little test. When we love God and keep his commandments, the reason we have knowledge and know and assurance we got the evidence ourselves when we love God, evidence of that is we keep his commandments. No, it's not talking about the big Ten Commandments that Moses got on Mount Sinai. It's talking about what Jesus said. He said, if you love me, uh, you'll uh, follow me. If you, if you love me, you'll do what I said. Now, here's the thing. In the flesh, we won't win them all. But you take anybody that's been saved and living for God, there's a great big difference on what they'll do and what they won't do. That's keeping the commandments of the Lord. And uh, keeping his commandments, it says in verse 3, his commandments are not grievous. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Now think on that. <clears throat> grievous, painful. Hurtful. His commandments are not that. They're not grievous. But the devil wants you to think they are. And you're dealing with young people and older people. It's always, what have I got to give up to become a Christian? What's it, how is it going to hurt me to be saved? What am I doing now that I would have to stop doing? His commandments were, are grievous to that mindset, see. It was to mine and to yours, I'm, I, I, I'm sure. Instead of flipping the coin and saying, what do I gain by being saved? 
Everybody's worried about what it's going to cost them. The cost has been paid on the cross of Calvary, and that was the cost you couldn't pay. So all when you get saved, everything's on the benefit side. Everything's on the on the black side of the ledger. It's on the on the plus column. But uh, the devil wants you to know that. Now J Jesus said that himself. I won't turn to it, but you probably know. But over in John chapter ten, he said, "I have come that they might have what life, and have it more abundantly." What does that mean? It's going to be better. Eternal life has some benefits even in this world. Think about that. Yeah. Think about sleeping at night when you lay down with a clear conscience instead of one that's hurting. Think about the thing you've done you hope will never be found out, but you fear one day it might be. Do you know the devil's going to run your past life by you, the sins you committed, but if you've been saved, we get the peace immediately by saying, hey, that's under the blood. Amen. I've been saved from that. I'm not that guy anymore. I live in a different world than he lived in. I follow a different leader than I used to follow. And there's peace that comes from that. Real great peace. I mean, uh, I think about the story. I probably doubt it happened this way, but <clears throat> historically it's written. <clears throat> old Martin Luther who was given credit for the Protestant Reformation. And he discovered, out of, getting out of Catholicism, what got him out was he discovered the scripture, the just shall live by faith, justification by faith. And the great peace and victory it brought. <clears throat> but uh, it is said that Martin Luther woke up one night and saw the devil standing at the foot of his bed. The devil had a long scroll, long piece of paper rolled up. You know what a scroll is. It's sort of like that roll of toilet paper in the restroom when it got away and rolled on the floor. What a terrible analogy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. The devil just unleashed the scroll. Long piece of paper come trailing down. And he said to Martin, this is a list of your sins. You understand I've got them all written down. It's a list of your sins on this scroll. The story is that Martin Luther said, all right, devil, right at the bottom, right, all paid for by Jesus Christ and his blood. <laughs> well, that's where you get your peace. All right, devil, I did do this wrong. Thank God I got saved. I'll never do that again. And I regret that. And I repented of that. And uh, well, that's, that's real peace, brother. That's real peace. And uh, his commandments are not grievous. It says uh, more abundant, more abundant life. Now, as a pastor for all the years I've been and also uh, it, course serving through the Christian school and counseling with so many young people this this is where it is the world is telling them uh, take a drink take a smoke do this do that and do do with your friends and, and all the joy you're gonna get no joy is something that's deep and lasting you may have fun for the moment Moses declared it this way he chose the afflictions of God's people rather than the pleasures of sin for a season Sin is always seasonal. It's a flash in the pan. It comes, and the fun it can bring. Uh, joke about it all we want to. We've seen cartoons with the old drunk waking up in the morning, holding his head, just hurting so bad. In the caption below, he said, this sleep is killing me. I felt good when I went to bed. You understand that's sin. That's the paying for sin on the other side, the pain that it, that it brings. And uh, the lie that is taught to our young folks today is do it now. A real test of character and Christian character is whether or not you can wait on God for the desired end he'll give you or whether you've got to grab in the old beer commercial, grab for all the gusto you can, grab for it now. Get it temporarily. And on the altar of temporary, so many long-range victories are, are sacrificed. And uh, you never have them. 
Uh, scripture says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And uh, waiting is not that you sit down in a chair and wait, but that you serve God the right way. You walk by his commandments. They're not grievous. And these verses are talking to us personally on the inside of, of the family. Now he says here in, the, in verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now in Christ, we can become and we are overcomers. We don't have to believe the devil's lie. The way of victory over the world is found here in verses 4 and 5. Uh, you're born of God, you've received Christ, then you have that power to say no to the world and all of its attractions, all of its uh, temptations. You do that by faith. What's the faith in what? Faith in what God said is true. Faith in how God will bring the end, how you will reap in the end if you'll believe God all the way. That's it. It's not all that mystery about it. Do I believe this book is being fulfilled and everything in it will be? Then that is my faith. Then if I believe that, know that, why would I do the things against that? I'm not going to let the flesh lead me about. It may get a moment's victory sometime. I may, I'll just use something simple. I may eat an extra piece of pie when I shouldn't have. Now that's light. We can add anything you want to that illustration. I may lose a, a little bit here or there, but I don't have to keep doing it. Somebody said this, talking about a man looking on a maid in the book of Job. Job made a covenant with God that he would not look upon a maid, and we understand what he was saying, the lust of the flesh. Somebody said, you're going to have those temptations, but you don't have to say yes to them. And even if you do, you can go back and repent and not do it again. Man, I used to have a boss man. He was tough. I'm glad for him now. I sure would hate to go through it again. Worked with him as soon as I was a senior in high school on for a while. He used to say to me when I'd make a mistake, and I made plenty, he'd say, Mickey, a good man never makes the same mistake twice. Now that was his way of saying, you want to get fired, do it again. I, I got that. <laughs> I received that message all, all right. In the book of Job, Job talking about not looking upon a maid. Somebody said, you cannot help the birds flying over your head, but you can stop them from parking and making a nest in your hair. Now, man, there's some good wisdom in that. Yeah, you, you may not can help it when she walks by for an instant, but don't let the bird build a nest in your hair. <laughs> it's one thing to see a bird fly over. It's something else to let the bird take over. Hey, that might be a little corny to you, but it's talking about the, talking about the challenge in the flesh. And we do have power to overcome. That's part of overcoming of verse 4 here. Overcoming the world. The victory that overcometh the world is our faith. My faith is I believe God. I believe his word. I believe it's going to turn out like he said. And I believe it's best to obey God. Sometimes we've had a gadget break down. Maybe at Christmas time trying to get something out of the box and put it together. I don't know. But... Uh, Oftentimes, from an automobile on back through many things, somebody said that thing needs to be taken back to its maker. Well, that's exactly what we do. We believe our maker. We believe he knows all about, he knows where the round peg goes in the square hole, he, my, our maker. Somebody said the old T-model days, Henry Ford, that a fellow was driving his T-model and it quit running. And he was side the road fussing about it. And another guy pulled up in another T-model and got out and said, hey, uh, can I help you? He said, no, leave me alone. The guy drove off. Another man said, you know who you were talking to? You were talking to Henry Ford. He made this thing. <laughs> oh, man, our maker knows the best. Amen. He made us. All right, my time's up.
and maybe a minute over. Brother Bird, I'm sorry. 702, not too bad here on first Sunday, New Year. Amen.